Good evening, everyone. I'm Rebecca Hoogs, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Executive Director of Seattle Arts and Lectures. When people move on from organizations, one of the silver linings is that there's often an opportunity to form new connections, relationships, and partnerships. And I'm so delighted that our former Executive Director, Ruth Dickey, brought this event to Sal through her, her new role at the National Book Foundation. And I'm grateful to the magic of technology that we can work together across time zones to bring this special free event to you. Tonight's science and literature program will feature poet Linda Hogan in conversation with Washington's very own state poet laureate, Rena Priest. To tell you more about the science and literature program in tonight's presenters, I'd like to introduce the best boss ever, my friend and National Book Foundation Executive Director, Ruth Dickey. Uh, thank you so much, Rebecca. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, we're so thrilled that, to be together virtually tonight. Welcome to Science and Literature, Reading the Natural World. And thank you to Rebecca and the whole amazing team and community at Sal to, for all you do to create community around books and for partnering with us on this event tonight. Science and Literature is the National Book Foundation's newest topical program launched in partnership with the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation this spring. Each year, an expert committee will select three exceptional books across genres to deepen readers' understanding of science and technology with a focus on work that highlights the diversity of voices in the field. We're so very grateful to our inaugural committee, our chair, Lydia Millett, Dr. Morgan Helene, Dr. Sophia U. Noble, Margot Lee Shetterly, and Erin Yazzie, with special thanks to the Sloan Foundation's Vice President and Program Director, Doran Weber, for his leadership and support. Tonight, we have the honor of highlighting one of our three selected titles, The Radiant Lives of Animals by Linda Hogan, to kick off our summer of free public programs, which included free book distributions of The Radiant Lives to readers at the Indigenous Peoples Institute in Seattle University, Heritage University in Toppenish, and the Institute of American Indian Arts. In their citation for The Radiant Lives of Animals, the selection committee wrote, quote, Linda Hogan's book is a brilliant evocation of the infinite ways in which the subjects of nature shape human perception and being. In both verse and prose, Hogan draws on native ways of seeing the biological, the botanical, the geological, and the cosmological that have long been sidelined or suppressed, offering readers a heart-rendering glimpse of the beauty of the wild world and the trauma of its destruction, end quote. Linda will read from her luminous book and then join Rena Priest, Washington State Poet Laureate, in conversation. For those tuning in live, we'll share links in the chat so you can buy books. While you're at it, we'd encourage you to purchase all three science and literature selections, including In the Field by Rachel Paston and The Kissing Bug by Daisy Hernandez, alongside Rena's beautiful collections, Sublime Subliminal and Patriarchy Blues. Without further ado, Linda Hogan Chickasaw is a poet, novelist, essayist, teacher, and activist. Her work illuminates environmental and indigenous activism, as well as native spirituality. She was born in Oklahoma and now lives and works in Colorado in a tiny town of 252 human souls. Her literary works have earned her fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Guggenheim Foundation, and the Native Arts and Culture Foundation, and awards including the Native Writers Circle of the Americas Lifetime Achievement Award and the Henry David Thoreau Prize. Rena Priest is a poet and an enrolled member of the Lummi Nation. She is the current Washington State Poet Laureate and a 2022 Maxine Cushing Grade Distinguished Writing Fellow. She is the recipient of an Allied Arts Foundation Professional Poets Award and fellowships from Inapo and the Vaden Foundation. She is the author of two poetry collections, Sublime, Subliminal, and Patriarchy Blues, which received an American Book Award. Priest holds an MFA from Sarah Lawrence College. And now I'll let Linda and Rena take it away. Thanks so much for being with us and enjoy the program. This is called Eagle Feather Prayer. I thank the eagle and old mother for this prayer. I send to earth and sky and the sacred waters. I thank old mother and the golden eagle. They are the ones who taught me to pray without words. They taught the part of me that is connected to, it is not named by anatomy books. 
And so I stand facing you and the rest of creation, also with secret names. I send this prayer, thanking those who risk their lives for clean, sweet water. And once again, there is the great silence of what happened to the buffalo. We love our horses. We love the dogs who helped, who helped us. We love the wilderness of buffalo herds. We are humans who love. With no words, just with a part of my named self, I hold this fan from Old Mother and the Eagle. With all my strength, I send this prayer so very silent. Thank you, Linda. That was really beautiful way to start us off. Um, I just, uh, before we begin, I want to tell you that it was a real pleasure to read your book. And as I read, I continuously was reminded that if I'm not going around in awe and wonder at the beauty of this natural world, then I'm not paying attention. And it's wonderful that your words um, can, can remind us that and give us that. Will you tell us about the eagle in this poem? Well, yes, I used to work at the Birds of Prey Rehab Foundation in Broomfield, Colorado. And the golden eagle was one who could not reach the, could not fly up to the uh, top branches where the other birds, the other eagles uh, landed and waited to fly. The flight cages there were enormous. We would get um, in another flight cage, owls and birds from Alaska via American Airlines. <laughs> and it's a way to fly for birds. And um, this particular golden eagle would sit on a branch and a uh, short one. And as I would clean up around her and take care of her, she would uh, comb my hair with her beak and make sure that I was ready to fly and that I was groomed well enough and sometimes put a wing over me. And while I realized that they had the power to kill, we formed a special connection. And I also called her grandmother uh, after all the grandmothers and loved her very much. And we were rather close when she, because she could never fly again, had to go away to a another facility uh, as an educational bird. And it was a grief for me to lose her um, because, well, we had a connection that was very deep, that the kind there are no words for, a kind of love you can't speak because it's between species and there are so few words to talk about that connection. And so grandmother went to uh, Ohio and um, became a, an educational bird, which was good because otherwise she would have been um, put to sleep uh, as the birds are that can't be rehabilitated and are not educational birds. So um, that's part of the story of this poem the story of uh, the bird who taught me silence and to pray with stillness, without words. Thank you. So you talk about connection and throughout your book, there's this expressed urge to connect. And I keep feeling that this is something that's missing from Western ways of knowing and that it's impacted our attitudes towards the earth, our home, and contemporary science, it's not motivated by connection, but uh, values exploration for the purpose of extracting resources 
or exploitation of the behavioral responses of people or other beings. Um, will you share your thoughts on the value of connection in science, the kind that you're talking about with this evil, of, of the way of understanding? Well, I think in science, um, that connection would be discouraged. Um, it would be something that uh, would not be an acceptable feeling because if you were to have a bird or an animal that was part of your work, you would have to keep your distance from your heart, the distance from your heart, since most of them would be euthanized at the end of your work. And also, I think that the connection isn't so much an urge as it is an event and an experience, and that we all can have that. We all have that connection if we're attentive and open to it. It's a natural connection, and it should exist within us, as it does between all other species. One thing, living in Idledale, uh that I'm aware of is how all of the animals can be together in a, in a pasture. Uh, the wild turkey, the deer, the elk, everything is together without conflict. But the minute a human comes near, they're all gone. And we have failed in our role to be the protectors and the caretakers of the earth, the animals and the plants, and also the soil. Yeah, it's a, it's a way of seeing, isn't it? And you begin your book, The Radiant Lives of Animals, with a discussion about seeing and uh, the, way that we, the way that we see how that influences our experience of the world. You give examples from Pliny and Euclid and Plato, observing how in European natural histories, human imagination was most often projected onto the outside world, and that vision was about the seer and not the seen, while for tribal thinkers, it's the world outside that creates our humanity. And you talk about soul loss, how that's what happens when the world around us disappears. Will you share more about the contrasts and outcomes of these different ways of seeing? Yes, and I'll read more also, but first let me say that um, one of the problems we have as human beings is to think that the world does emanate from ourselves, that we somehow are the center of it all. It says when we make maps, we are the center of the map, we're our location, and so and in that particular essay you're talking about at the beginning, it's called The Great Without, and it is about the human soul. And where does the human spirit live? Where does the human mind live? And when you think of it, it doesn't have a location that we can name. So in my world, I think of and in the indigenous world, I think of the soul as living around us and outside of us and in our environments and ecosystems. It's in our knowledge of those worlds, and that's part of us. We are a part of it, so therefore we can't project ourselves onto the world. One of the things I found with too many nature writers, as people would call themselves, or environmental authors, eco-writers, is that the things they're writing is really about themselves, not about the world around them, not about the topic they're writing, of their writing. Um, they're really writing about their own self in the world. Thank you. And will you read for us again? Well, I was going to read the uh, essay called The Enchantments, and I love that word. 
All of these thoughts come to me around that word enchantment, a word rich and complex in meaning. This world holds great resonance and depth. My thoughts are like the root meaning of the word. They are about a state of being, but also recall the roots of the word to chant, to sing, incant, incantare, a story, a great poem. In our own tribal nation, the Shikaza, fear of us holds to the oldest of ways. Few of us hold to the oldest of ways. Reasons exist for that lack of knowledge from the past. For one thing, we are among the earliest survivors. We are descendants of the first almost colonized people. When De Soto appeared on the East Coast in 1551. However, since that, since that time, we have had many countries and religious groups bending our histories, creating warfare against us, manipulating our world. Because of all this, so few ancestors had the chance of surviving unless they finally took on the ways of intruders. Colonized by many, we were still forcibly moved from our homelands to Indian Territory, or Oklahoma, as it became known. Through all of this, it was nearly impossible to keep our original knowledge, our first instructions from creation. to keep our ceremonies and our treaties with the earth also and her other than human inhabitants. My other family is Ogallala Lakota. They still hold the remnants of traditional ways, but in a different sense than what I am considering here. Some have become Catholic. Some practice traditional ways. Some do both. Unlike these nations, Navajo still largely hold to the complex ceremonials called chantways, a sacred system of myths, prayers, song, and extraordinary sand paintings, medicinal plants, and more, all of which are connected. So far, restoring a person to a place of emotional health. It is an old way and now many different practitioners may have only a single role in performing one long song, one prayer, or some one other part of that ceremony. Each is the recitation of something very ancient, complex, and yet recalled for a community or for a single person. These ceremonies are created in many ways, yet most are designed to bring a person and community into balance. Hojo is the word meaning wholeness and harmony within their place for within their community. Then with the physical environment of those around them, the spiritual environment, expanding all the way out to the universe. It is an elaborate system of relationships with a mere human standing in place within the greater entirety. Even the first creators from mythic creation and the world's early inhabitants, and with the exclusion of sacred lands, or the inclusion, excuse me, the inclusion of sacred lands, animals, and plants of the mountain bounded world, the remembered words and songs carry a harmony to all of this as a restored world.
This recreation takes place through language and image, songs, prayers, through the speaking of a people's original knowledge. It is akin to the power of enchantment, an intelligent word that holds all stories spoken. It holds the spirit close in a state of awe and wonder. This realm dwells in the heart of each small human. It lives at our soul depths. But first we learn to become connected, connect, conscious and connected to the smallness of our own human self and the greatness in the greatness of the world around us. This consciousness appears in a moment caught within one full beauty and our full beauty as well. One spring many years ago, I went to the deer dance of the Yaqui in Arizona. This dance is a ceremony passed down from ancient and unearthed time, unmeasured time. In daylight was the singing and much more that as an outsider, I would never know. Dancing took place in the church courtyard with women dressed in black and mourning. Everywhere in the desert realm were evergreen sprigs, clowns appeared. The day passed with much activity, and even as an observer, I felt its profundity. I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to walk away from something so clearly meaningful. And so I remained late, late into the night. One man danced tirely and without end, wearing white buckskin, the head of a deer above the human head with flowers and evergreen in his antlers. Firelight or moonlight shone on his skin. Singing took place as he danced himself out of one world and into another, a state of what the people would, tr would call true enchantment. Later, I read what it, that it was a song cycle that begins in the enchanted mountain forest with the story of a young deer or fawn coming from the forest mountains, the evergreen trees with spring flowers in its antlers. And it is as is written in one of the many books about the ceremony. Flower covered fawn went went out, it says. Flower covered fawn went out, enchanted from each enchanted flower wilderness world. He went out. Flower covered fawn went out, enchanted from each enchanted flower wilderness world. He went out. This is only one version of the beginning, and it's important for us to note that the mountains are still the center of the Yaqui world, even though the people were pushed out by the Spanish into the desert. Again, the realm of cantos, stories, songs, and dance return a people to the past and the past to the present. To the people, a sense of wholeness begins with that first hypnotic passage and moves to some parts of life before invasion from inside the first world. Reading the songs of different deer dance singers, all speak of the world of story and how song and dance are a part of enchantment, bringing the human into a more than human realm. 
a consciousness too rarely beholding the world. Beholding is the correct word because this dance and the days around it derive from meeting the world with deep human awe. From the roots of enchantment, something of our lives and their broken parts come together to make for wholeness. Wholeness, completeness. It begins with something as ancient as that memory of the young deer coming from the forest with spring flowers entangled in his antlers. For Native people, harmony and wholeness are of importance in our lives. Words and songs have been a key to open that harmony. In Christianity, even in the creation story of the Bible, the world was created with words of God saying, let there be. And there was that word God itself, according to the origin. Its true meaning is a word that means to call out or to invoke or to address. Perhaps we have not just words or invocations, but more than that. For many nations, wind enters our lives with our first breath at birth and it carries us through life. It even creates who we become. At death, our breathing returns to the world and the wind with the wind. And spoken words, the air, wind, all alive. This is a small planet. We breathe what the elk breathes or that spring deer coming from the evergreen our breath crosses continents. Close in, I breathe the forest plants around me. It is the same breath of horse, deer, mountain lion, bear, even the hiss of the rattlesnake. Those who came to this place long ago traveled long distances. Tribal seekers and hunters dwelt here in these rocks. Some came to pray and pay respect to the land. I think of their voices at night when I'm outside listening to the poor well and horned owl, and when I hear plants move in the breeze, or by daylight when a blooming tree is alive with the hum of bees taking in the pollen. I listen, and sometimes I sing my own words back to what I hear around me. Considering the world of plants as a part of all this, the botanist friend reminds me that not only do the plants heal, but a song goes with each plant that heals. Eduardo, the Peruvian healer, called his own form of healing the enchantments. In his litany of healing, or even of finding a lost item, he recites not only the names of the mountains, the place names, but those of all the lives around them. Red Mountain, White Mountain, Red Wolf, White Dog, he goes calling with the beautiful flowering gardens, the sun and moon and the herbs. He goes calling, naming all this the keeping of accounts. Eduardo, when he was alive, said, let us go calling and accounting for this world. Here are my accounts, my stories and songs small events in a very large world. I'm so happy that you shared that essay with us. That was one of my favorites. It's so beautiful. And as a poet thinking about um, the way that poetry means, you know, to bring into being or to make, to makers, right? It's um, etymology is from that. Um, 
and that you mention that even even the even the God of the Bible talks about let there be and there was. I like that. Um, I'm learning my tribal language right now, and there's a lot in it that English doesn't have that I can kind of see the way that the the ancestors thought about the world by the way the words describe things. Um, we call the cottonwood tree, it's quayalich each, meaning the dancing tree. And you can kind of see uh, in your mind's eye, you know, um, the tree, the tree that dances <laughs> and things. Um, the Kulhalmachin, our relatives under the sea, that's our word for killer whales. Um, so I love, I just really love this chapter and that you talk about uh, naming things and identity, you know, having a relationship to a thing by what we call it in a way. Will you talk a little bit about um, the songs and the dances and how uh, there's somewhat the source of enchantment? Will you share a little bit about the history um, of the criminalization of, of indigenous spiritual ways um, and ceremonies and songs and dances and how that has impacted our real, our ability to, ma I guess, maintain those relationships, even the outlawing of our languages. Um, yeah, criminalization yeah. is exactly it, being put in prison for practicing mm -hmm. your own religion. But I was yeah. interested in what you said about the cottonwood tree being the dancing tree, because perhaps this isn't true where you're from, but on the plains, the cottonwood is the tree for um, the sun dance. And it's the central tree. My great granddaughter was the tree girl in the sun dance. So that was really important to me. I'm sure you were thinking about the movement of it, but it had a different meaning for me. And we have words that are very similar to that, that mean life and mean south flowing, which have to do with our river systems because we were forest and river people. But back to the criminalization, um, how did that affect us? I remember because of my, um, my time in Oklahoma when I was young, that before my father was in the army, um, that it was a, uh, we, our dances were banned. And so there was an elder named Buster Ned who would do dances in the mountains and secret places. And so we would go uh, dance. And yet, had we been caught, it would have been, we would have, not us as children, but we would have been jailed. They would have been imprisoned. And there was even a time where wearing hair long was meant imprisonment for the men. And so every part of our culture, every part of our language, every part of our spiritual lives were banned by the United States, which wanted to assimilate us. They thought that we should either be dead or assimilated or imprisoned, um, also put in mental institutions. There were mental institutions that people who didn't cooperate went to, were forced to go to. So yes, that had a a powerful influence on particularly my father's generation because he was told by his family and after the um, after Wounded Knee uh, they were particularly afraid of the United States and so um, they were told by the family not to speak their own language even even their own language but although my grandparents spoke it at home. And when I was in Oklahoma, I uh, tried to learn the language. However, being in Colorado, 
it's very difficult because I'm not with any native language speakers. So I have to work to remember the words that I've learned and how to put them together and how to make something past tense. So it's very, all of our lives have been affected by that particular history of criminalization that you're talking about. And education, religion, spiritual, the Christianity, um, boarding schools, the everything, every part of our lives. And that knowledge of how to how to be in relationship with the other beings of the world that all of that contains, right? Will you talk about uh, Nan? That was, of course. Uh, I'm sorry, I interrupted. But of oh, course, that no. was being an animist, and that was illegal. That was yeah. against the law to be a pagan during the time of Christianity. I was going to ask, it was kind of the perfect segue to hear about Nan Oksha. I think I'm saying that. Am I saying that right? Um, Nan Oksha. And also, yeah, Good. and also to talk Good. about the shift from um, science not acknowledging that animals were sentient beings to now they do acknowledge that animals are sentient and how how that shift might have occurred and how we can kind of push uh, Western science towards these this wholeness that you talk about in enchantments. I think Western science is starting to consider that there is animal intelligence, um, that as they study, um, because it has to be a controlled experiment, of course, um, and not just truth as we know it um, or observe it, but somehow in, in a controlled environment, um, they have acknowledged that crows are extremely intelligent, corvid, the entire corvid family, um, extreme intelligence, and that gorillas and chimps whose DNA is similar to ours and genetically the chimps in particular, that they are have emotion, have many human uh, similarities. They're, in New Zealand, they've recognized a river as a person. In, you know, in here recently in a trial of an elephant suing a zoo, um, the Bro in Bronx, the Bronx, the elephant won and now will be released from the zoo. And the reason was that it could identify a mark on its face um, in a mirror. And they thought that that was finding that mark on that side of its face was enough to say that it was intelligent, as if they couldn't already know the intelligence of elephants by their behaviors, actions, and by the observances of many other people uh, in their environment. So what we as indigenous people have known forever um, has never been an accepted part of science. And so now Native science is coming into its own. And um, I think that Western science has no choice but to identify with it and to accept some of it. And they're not there yet altogether, but I think it's happening. And for that, I am grateful, and I think the Earth is too. As we watch species vanish, we go into grief as uh, our own for our own species and with our own species, within our own species. And so we are having to acknowledge what is outside of us. Perhaps it's selfish a selfish thing, and that we're acknowledging that only because it endangers us 
we are a very endangered species now. Yeah. Wow. It's true. I, uh, I had a conversation with a person talking about extinction events and he was talking about the larger the animal, the more endangered and people are pretty big. <laughs> so um, anyway, sidetrack here. Will you talk a little bit about the, uh, the definition? Yeah. <laughs> it is true. I mean, what's happening in to giraffes, elephants, what's happening in the world to, to them is sometimes unspeakable horror if we look at it from their perspective. To have a trophy hunt makes no sense. No. There is no reason for it. And I do not understand the psychology that goes into it, but I'm trying to understand human beings because it's so important to be able to communicate to humans what we have here on Earth and how sacred it all is. Yes, that's the most important thing. And I feel that comes across in your book and the concept of Nanuksha. Will you tell us about that? I feel it means sharing. all alive. It means all alive. And it also is the word for animal or all animals, but any, you know, they're all alive. And it's a recognition of the significance and life of the animal. That word, um, okcha, means it has so many different meanings, ways of meaning. It also has to do with the flow of the waters to the Gulf of Mexico, a lot from the Mississippi. That has to do with the living water. So nan okcha means all alive. That's so beautiful. If that's a, a way of understanding the world that could be embraced by, you know, popular society, we wouldn't be able to have trophy hunts. That just would not be a conceivable thing. People wouldn't be able to understand how that could possibly be if everybody kind of had this way of relating to animals as being all alive and that that life is sacred, right? As you're saying, to hold it sacred. Um, so thank you well, for sharing. Yeah that definition with us. Thank you for asking about it. Yeah. Um, also, you... uh, the word, um, the, the word for uh, Tish, uh, Tishamingo, where I lived, meant peace chief, not the name of a man, which is commonly how people understand that word. But Tish is like the word hojo, which means having to do with harmony, wholeness, and health, because health depends on having that wholeness inside a human being's relationship with the all. That's beautiful. I think about... Um... There's an anecdote that you share with us in the book about when you're watching the ants and you see that they're <laughs> doing something to their nest where they are taking little sticks of a certain size. And after watching them for a while, you contribute, you decide to try to contribute a stick and you see that it's accepted. And that as part of that accepted, you know, acceptance, you're being accepted in a way and included. And I just really loved that um, way of observation, of observing the world. And I think it spoke to me as a way, the way that um, indigenous science works, right? It's like a non-invasive, it's not interfering, it, it's not interfering with their, um, what they're doing, but it's observing deeply and connecting and being a part of it, like you say. Um, is there... So and I and I think about how in observing in that way you become a part of this this evidence, this body of evidence that informs indigenous ways of knowing, like indigenous ways of science, right? Um 
and it gets passed down and then people understand this relationship between ants and people and that connection that's there. I think that's just so beautiful. I think well, it, it also has to do with, you know, I was thinking of what kind of structure they were building beneath the ground that we don't know, we don't see. Um, but they obviously were building and creating something. And it must have been incredible and magnificent, whatever they were doing. But in Australia, uh, the people know when a fire is coming close to them because the ants put out a piece of quartz that reflects the fire back, the heat back to keep their, their homes from overheating. And when they see that quartz, the people, human people, I mean, see that quartz outside the uh, ants' homes, they realize that a fire is going to be arriving. And so they can take care of keeping themselves safe as well. I loved in that essay, I really like the story of the woman who um, cooperated with the ants. And so they came to in the big ants, the giant ants that came into her home and um, cleaned it for her. <laughs> and the man who tried so hard to protect himself against the ants, and that they sent out chemical messages and messengers, message, message to all the other ants that swarmed his place and all the things he was trying to protect were gone. As if they knew what he wanted to protect and how in the world they could get to it is a mystery. I love because that story. I do too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is there's more there's What? Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. I said his poor butterfly collection was all gone. <laughs> yeah, I like that too because it talks about another way of like the way that animals instruct people. You know, um, the way that we have lessons to learn from from whatever it is that they're teaching us about, you know, hanging on to things or cooperation with nature. I think that that comes through in that story really beautifully. Um, and also, also that she could think like an ant. She knew how they, she knew them well enough yeah. to think like an ant. Yeah. And then you talked too in that essay about the scientist who was rather than just, you know, taking into account hundreds of years of indigenous observations of the ants. He had to go and do his, his scientific method. Um, but that he observed them by inserting a device down into the ant hill so that they couldn't, couldn't communicate. I think if I'm understanding correctly, but that they made a mirror image of each other's ant hill. Um, and then he talks about the soul. Let me see. I have the actual quote here. One second. It's just great because um, it is science unavoidably acknowledging this one mind, the, uh, the, the mind that exists outside of the individual. Let's see. It's just wonderful. Okay. He says, um, it's Eugene Murray discussing the architecture of an ant hill said, it is the instinct and design of a separate soul situated outside of the individual termite. And then you, you mention that and you say, um, you talk about how a science that embraces enchantment and the idea of a soul that lives outside of the individual could change humanity. And I was wondering if you would share a little bit about what you, how that could work. Whatever an ego is, if we didn't have that and we understood that the soul included everything, that would, it would have to change humanity because humans would not be competitive. They wouldn't think about themselves. They wouldn't um, want and need things that they think they want and need but don't actually 
And so it would make a big difference there if if we were not competitive beings, if we were not angry beings, um, which anger is really founded in hurt primarily. Um, it's not about justice, anger, angry just angry for justice, social justice, which seems like a, a good reason to be angry. But um, if we acknowledged that everything around us was nan okja, that would be uh, changing our entire world. And the people who are indigenous on all continents do think that same way. It's not yeah. unique to our continent. Yeah, it's true. I uh, in our culture, in in the Lummi culture, we have in our language we have the phrase "aitachni," which translates to good feelings. Um, but there's always these, you know, there are always these deeper layers of meaning. And I was, it was explained to me that good feelings is when you're of one heart and one mind with others around you. And there's no conflict between what you think and what you feel and that there's no conflict between um, your thinking and feeling towards others that, you know, there's that harmony that, that you talk about in enchantments, um, that wholeness, and that's good feelings. Um, so uh, let's see, I, I think. And I like that, I like the good feelings because sometimes when people are with community, there's judgment, there's all kind. there are people worrying about what other people think of them. But when you're in that, com your, your own community, everyone knows everyone else and there is no sense of that. There, needs to be no sense of that either. I mean, where you just have a feeling of care and love for all the other people. And we don't even have that in families anymore. I think that uh, this is a good segue to your poem. Will you read your poem, One Creation? I am a warrior wanting this world to survive, never forgotten this earth which gave birth to the bison, the scissor tail, even the vultures of Tibet consuming the finally released mystics, the old ones who taught we are always a breath away from bullets. I am from a line of songs, a particle of history told by the wrong people, a country before lines of division. In every gully lies the power of a forest waiting. It heard the stories elders told when they crossed this canyon where I live. I dreamed they passed down to the creek bed, each human creation still present, also loving the stones I love, the mosses between them, the remembered creek that runs all year. It is hard for some to know the world is a living being. Some live with forgotten truths, Others replace truth with belief. That's why the books of the Maya were burned, like the ones of Australia and the close north. We can weep over such things as lost love, as the passing away of others, the passage away of others, but also remember those birds, the bison, the grief they have felt, and how the land hurts in more chambers than one small heart could ever hold. Oh, it's such a powerful poem. Uh, wow, it's really, um, 
It's wonderful to hear you read it. So thank you so much for that. And just to close here, um, we have time for just a little bit more discussion. You, you talk in one, one of your essays about the bison and uh, there's a story. You, you talk about storytelling and the importance of storytelling. Um, and there's a, there's a hopeful story that I hope you'll share about um, one of the Plains tribes bringing bison back to their territory and how that has impacted um, their homelands. Yes. Um, this was the first time that bison were returned, and it was Alex Whiteplume, who I've been trying to reach. Um, he's in South Dakota most of the time, and um, he had, was a person who decided to return the buffalo to their lands. And so they brought a herd of buffalo, and the buffalo uh, hooves were so heavy that they brought water to the surface of earth. And the elders at the time said that they hadn't seen those particular creeks and streams since they were children, but they returned and with the feet of the bison. And so the weight of them, um, brought back the water, which then brought back many plants that had been there. And the plants brought back um, the birds, the insects, which brought back the birds. And the birds brought back all the other creatures. So soon there were entire herds of deer and all kinds of life in those areas that had been pretty much barren and dried up until the buffalo came back. So now it's a grassland again. And since then, many tribes have returned bison to their lands and have had the grasses growing in a healthy environment since then. There are groups of people who are trying to make a buffalo commons from up in Canada down to maybe down to South Dakota, I'm not sure. They're trying to purchase land or find lands that they can have an entire region that's only bison. That would be amazing. That would be amazing. That's such a beautiful, thank you so much for sharing that with us and um, sort of sending us out with this hopeful, hopeful um, vision for what can happen when we restore things to their natural way. Uh, it's just a really beautiful story. Um, and I really enjoyed being in conversation with you today and having this opportunity to talk about your beautiful book. Thank you so much for, oh, for your you. work. Thank your you, Rina. And keep up your own good work. Kaishka. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the hosts who brought us together today also. This has just been a really wonderful conversation. I hope we get a chance to visit again. Me too. I know we will. <laughs>